Chapter 30 Cooks The five lads tried making the best of a van ride that took up most of the day. Listening to JCDs, talking about life, and fighting the heat by drinking endless Cokes and bottles of mineral water. Joe had scheduled a single toilet stop in an unidentifiable field, but as the second half of the journey dragged on, she refused to make another, even though the lads were all busting. Viv's solution was to piss into an Evian bottle and lob it out through the hatch in the roof. James cracked up laughing and couldn't resist the urge to copy. Seconds later, the boys got thrown around as the van stopped abruptly at the side of the road. Which one of you idiots did that? Joe steamed as she ripped open the back door of the van. James sheepishly raised a finger. Then you're a stupid little prick, Joe spluttered. We're not heading to summer camp, you know. What would have happened if that bottle hit another car? What if someone pulled our number plate and the cops stop us further up the road? Viv butted in angrily. Hey, Miss High and Mighty, it's okay for you sitting up there in air conditioning. We're cooking back here. We've been drinking gallons and I've asked for another toilet break loads of times. Joe swiped the gun out of her trousers and pointed it at Viv's head. I'm not stopping you from peeing in the bottle, moron, but there is no need to throw it out through the roof. Was it you that threw the first one? What, are you going to shoot me for urinating? Joe clearly wasn't used to being back-chatted. She jumped inside the van, clicked off the safety, and pushed the gun against Viv's head. If you balls this operation up, I'll ram this gun in your mouth and spray your brains over the nearest wall. Hey, 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 Kyle said, raising his hands. We're all hot, we're all bored, and this is just a misunderstanding. So let's calm down, eh? We're all on the same team, Tom added. I've got my eye on you, Viv, Joe snarled as she slid the gun back into her trousers. Join the queue. A lot of women have their eyes on me, he responded, though James thought he looked uncharacteristically subdued. Joe shook her head with contempt as she jumped off the back of the van and punished the boy's eardrums by slamming the door as hard as she could. Tom scowled as he whispered to Viv. These are serious people. Are you ever going to learn when to keep your trap shut? Viv was rattled and made a pathetic attempt to disguise it. I can handle myself, he sneered, sounding like an eight-year-old who just lost a fight. Zara came off a 20-minute phone call and wandered out to the back garden. Meatball was allowed outdoors now that he'd had his vaccinations and was celebrating his newfound freedom by licking bugs off a tree trunk. Lauren sat in a sun lounger, reading a book called The Complete Idiot's Guide to Beagles. So, what's the news? Lauren asked. MI5 identified Joe from your photograph. Her real name is Rhiannon Jules. She's the daughter of Joe Jules. This last name was clearly intended to mean something, but Lauren didn't have a clue. Before your time, I guess, Zara grinned. Joe Jules was a singer-songwriter, shot down by Los Angeles police during a cocaine bust in 82. Rhiannon is his only daughter, and his albums still sell, so you can bet she's worth a few bob. Enough to fund the AFA? Definitely. Zara nodded. Remember the EAA? Lauren twisted up her face as she raked her brain. Extreme animal action? Is that the group Kenneth Markison was involved with in the 80s? Zara nodded. Most EAA members were women who lived in a commune. 
One of our research assistants found out that the commune was situated in a large country house which once belonged to an American singer-songwriter. Joe Jules, Lauren grinned. How'd you guess? Lauren shrieked as Meatball reared up and licked the bottom of her foot. <laughs> that tickles, she giggled as she gently nudged him away. Any news about the film studios? There certainly is, Zara grinned. Your hunch was spot on. They typed Jay Buckle into the police computer. He's been arrested twice at animal rights demonstrations, both times with Adelaide Kent. Two weeks ago, he was arrested on the set of Wild Ride 2 and questioned about a Volkswagen transporter that had disappeared a few days earlier. The charges are still on file, but the police haven't got enough evidence to charge him. At the time the van was stolen, it was loaded up with 300 grand's worth of TV cameras, studio lights and other equipment being used to shoot a documentary on the making of Wild Ride 2. And the cherry on the cake is that the theft of a re-spraying rig and a pressurised metal cylinder used in car stunts has also been reported to Avon Police. So, it was worth me hiding out and taking those photos. Lauren grinned. Zara nodded. We're starting to put together a really solid picture of the AFA. There's already enough evidence to move in and make arrests. Just one huge spanner in the works. At this moment, James, Kyle and all of the main AFA suspects have headed off to some unknown location with no intention of resurfacing until they've pulled off some kind of terrorist spectacular. Yeah, Lauren said. And I wonder what they want with all that TV equipment. The van finally arrived at a semi-derelict farmhouse with a dozen rooms spread over two stories. The lads were told to dump their stuff in a bare room with sleeping bags and pillows spread over the floor. Down in the kitchen, two men were cooking up a vegan roast to feed at least a dozen. Jay and Adelaide had equipment to set up inside the house and Viv was asked to join them shortly after they arrived. That left James, Kyle and Tom to stroll the isolated farm and wonder what they'd let themselves in for. Wherever we are, it's a long way from civilization, Kyle said. The sun was setting and he looked out over hills bedded with heather and rocky peaks in the distance. Pretty though, James said. What do you reckon? Scotland? I'm not sure we went that far, Kyle said. Maybe Northern England? Northumberland, or somewhere like that. As James turned back towards the house, he spotted Mark, aka Kenneth Markison, wading through the long grass and waving his arms. Get back here, he shouted. Everyone's waiting for you. Mark led them into a huge dining hall with a vaulted ceiling and dark patches on the walls where paintings had hung many years earlier. One end of the room had been set up as a TV studio, complete with cameras on wheeled tripods, bulky studio lights and a video production suite. The stage set consisted of pale blue background panels with two trendy black chairs and a man-sized cage at its centre. The cage had been designed for show rather than security, with chromed bars and a neck brace dangling inside. Joe stood at the opposite end of the room, in front of a giant flip chart on which she'd written the detailed plans for the operation. As the crowd gathered around her, Viv approached James, Kyle and Tom. He changed into a smart suit matched to an expensive looking tie. Did you and Joe make up and decide to get married? Tom grinned. Looks the business, doesn't it? Viv said. I've just had my screen test. I'm presenting the show. What show? Kyle asked. Joe clapped her hands together before Viv could answer. 
She looked sweaty, like she'd been hefting stuff about, and as always, the gun bulged at her waist. Can I have everyone's attention, please? She said sternly. James counted 11 people besides Kyle and himself as the room went quiet. Okay, Joe said. Thank you all for coming. I'm sorry that the journey was an undignified one for so many of you, but absolute secrecy is required for this operation to succeed. I'm sure none of you need reminding that while you're here, you're strongly advised not to divulge your surnames or any unnecessary personal details to people you don't already know. The launch of the AFA a few days back proved a spectacular success. The latest news is that Clyde Wainwright is still in a critical condition and unlikely to resume his job as the chairman of Malaric UK. But the general public are still not paying attention to our message. Animal rescues aren't even local news these days, and even the most spectacular property destruction gets scant attention. We live in a society that cares little about religion, and even less for the politicians and businessmen that lead it. But there is one group of people in which the public still has an extraordinary degree of interest. Celebrities. In less than 12 hours, we're going to have a celebrity guest in that cage at the opposite end of this room, and our very own TV show going out live on the internet. Joe looked pleased with herself as she paused to build up the suspense. For 24 hours, this room is going to be hosting the most sensational media event ever staged by liberationists. Joe leaned forward and dramatically ripped the front sheet off the flip chart, revealing an A3 sized mugshot of a man instantly recognized by everyone in the room. Comrades, Joe grinned. I give you our special guest, celebrity restaurateur and TV chef, Nick Cobb. 